Yeah, good evening, folks. Uh, Jim Salem uh, from Australia First Party. Uh, I'm speaking tonight with Michael, who is a, uh, a founding member of the youth organisation uh, known as Australian National Front, uh, which has appeared online in uh, several places. Good evening, Michael. Thanks for having me. No worries at all. Um, first up, I suppose, um, where did the ANF come from? Who are you guys? So the ANF originally came from some national socialist leaning circles, namely the NSN. We decided to go a different ideological and strategic route than what was originally done. And that's, yeah, that's basically where we came from. So you've obviously uh, branched out in the direction of an Australian nationalism, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Look, um, obviously uh, a new group, um, many things are happening. Uh, can you uh, maybe enlighten us to what you've actually been doing lately? So we're an activist organisation. We focus on great optics and aesthetics, as you can see with our posters and materials and stuff that we've been putting up. We also participate in some training and community building, but overall we would define ourselves as primarily an activist group, doing the raw activism, putting the posters on the street for the everyday Australian to observe in the public spheres. Do you think that um, you've actually administered uh, any impact at this stage or is it early days? Well, we definitely have had some impact. I've looked at the our website analytics and we've gotten how many thousands? I can't think off the top of my head, but especially in the first few months, we got like many, many thousands of views which were exactly in the same time periods that our poster runs and stuff happened. So I know that people definitely searched us up. It's definitely having a physical impact, but like mainly recently, we've been having more of a uh, digital impact, especially on TikTok. You know, it's a pretty, pretty youth-based application. One of our little video clips has recently gotten 35,000 uh, views, which is quite a significant amount of people seeing it. So yeah. Yes. Do you think that uh, the fact that it is an act of orientation is what's actually getting this attention? That it's not just purely the digital world? Well, yes. And I think that because of the route we've taken and how, I'd say, unique it is compared to like uh, conventional forms of activism, I'd say that, yes, it does attract more views. But some of the things we've gotten a lot of views on also haven't always been about the activism itself, but rather the ideological message. Like on TikTok, the, uh, our most viewed video clip was actually explaining nationalism for like a minute instead of like showing off what we're doing. So, yeah. And uh, do you get a lot of feedback from uh, ordinary people? Are they, uh, are they young people writing into you and exchanging views and ideas with you? Yes, uh, we've had a lot of likes. I think on that video we have around 3,000 likes. We've had a few hundred comments. A lot of people are commenting quite positively and saying this is like the type of thing we've needed for ages. You know, we love this this channel, et cetera, et cetera. We've also had a pretty massive surge in uh, recruits, you know, email applicants uh, around the age group of, well, 16 to 13. However, we've had to actually uh, decline active membership for that age range for a lot of different reasons like we don't want to groom them um yes. you know like illegal reasons optics maturity etc however that doesn't mean they can't support us no it certainly doesn't and do you find that uh, any of this uh, obviously at that particular age bracket 13 to 16 you're looking at high school students uh, maybe uh, tafe students uh, at the outside um do you think that there's actually a market in schools do you think school kids are listening yeah, they are, and I'm I'm fully certain that there is a growing uh, attitude uh, throughout the youth in that regards. Um, so we've had a lot of applicants, and most of them from high school. They say they're quite the way that I can interpret it. They're quite atomized. They don't have many people to talk to, and as soon as they see like something such as ANF pop up, they're like, "Oh, well, this is cool. This is what I've been waiting for for ages. It's something that's organized. It's." you know, people coordinating, it's, um, you know, nationalistic. 
Uh, that actually uh, raises an interesting point, which we can obviously go into now. It's always said, you know, that there's an incredible um, uh, anti-Australian bias in education uh, along various roads that uh, Australian history doesn't exist unless it's in, uh, interpretable as imperial uh, with uh, a pseudo-Aboriginal background to that and then multi culty But um, if a lot of uh, young folk are writing in and saying good work, that means that uh, they're actually trying to embrace their uh, Australian identity. Well, I think the harder the establishment pushes, uh, the more you get po like a polarity between the results in the youth. Like you have people who are, you know, full-blown Marxist types, and then you have the others which are turning more nationalist or even further like national socialist. Like, you know, the principle for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Of course. Well, that's pretty much it. So it could be, therefore, that um, the establishment, uh, to use the phrase actually that the Marxists love so much, uh, has created its own grave diggers. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's putting it pretty perfectly. Well, Karl Marx said that we can't blame him for everything. But um, I think uh, if it is a, uh, a surge in uh, youth interest, then it would only be a matter of time before there would be some official uh, opposition to that. Um, are you aware that that would be the case? And if so, uh, have you folks discussed it? Are you talking about Wait, as in an opposition to our influence? Yes, or? Yeah, yes. Uh, some uh, possible counteraction uh, in schools or other places to deal with. And I'll, I'll use the neutral term to a propaganda, which is actually uh, reaching out to people to change their minds, saying it's OK to be an Australian, uh, it's OK to be an Australian, perhaps have a European background. And that um, obviously that can't be permitted without challenge, can it? Yeah, well, I do think there could be a degree of backlash. However, I don't think it come solely from that specific outlet. It come from a variety of different angles um, because they don't, it wouldn't be a school teachers, you know, have found out about this evil nationalist group. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be like that. It'd just be kind of like, I would say conventional government harassment that's been done to similar groups. However, I do think that because of the optics we've chosen, and the aesthetics, it won't be as easy to target us as you would with some other more extreme groups that are around that don't exactly care about uh, those things as much. Yeah, I can certainly see that. I think that um, obviously uh, a, a constructive uh, politics that does reach out in schools or unemployment queues or uh, somewhere else um, can only deeply frustrate and annoy those forces that um, want to challenge. I uh, suppose in the end you will be challenged. Uh, not that that's a bad thing, but um, I assume that you're fully aware that you will be challenged. Well, our initial objective was to just try to make a, an impact throughout Australians in general. It wasn't to specifically target uh, the youth in a propaganda sense or anything. Uh, so it's just a kind of extra effect or extra impact that has come along alongside other impacts um and because we're you know actively saying we're not actually allowing anyone from those age groups in it won't be that easy for them to say oh well you know they're targeting the youth and stuff we're not even recruiting them so it's like mm. it's affecting them i would say like with their worldview however in terms of like active like involvement and stuff it's not I think we just developed a problem. Uh, what's the problem? Uh, hang on, I think we might have lost sound. No, we're back. Uh, oh, no okay. At all. I thought we might have lost uh, lost sound. Um, sorry, uh, uh, I didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, Proceed, please. Well, yeah, what I was saying is we're having a, I would say we're having a pretty significant impact uh, by using applications like TikTok and stuff. However, as I just said, it's not in a direct like involvement sense it's more in a kind of ideological a philosophical way and we've only just started our TikTok endeavors if you want to call it that and we've gotten probably a total of 50k views throughout uh, mainly australia because that's what we've tagged uh but it's also people all over the world as well so yeah do you think that uh most uh, um, people who call themselves Australian nationalists would see your uh, initiative positively. Uh, I do. 
Uh, do you think that um, it's being perceived in the right way, that it is a fresh initiative? Yeah, I'd, I'd think so. I'd say, unless if they've had their perception of it tainted by people who don't like nationalism or, you know, things of that nature, I'd say that kind of like the default reaction would be, oh, this is a pretty cool group. However, then there's others who'd be suspicious of it, like, oh, you know, a group with aesthetics like this must be run by feds or something like that. Well, you know, I'm not sure who would say that. Um, we might have some uh, opinions of who that might be. But, yeah. Um, um, we won't name anybody. Um, I would take the view um, that probably most uh, Australian nationalist uh, groups and organisations would certainly uh, support uh, the ANF's effort. Uh, have you, without giving any details, and obviously it's inappropriate to them, but have you reached out to other uh, uh, recognised Australian nationalists and said, you know, we're here on the scene and uh, please talk to us? It's actually been the other way around. We haven't really needed to because we've gotten quite a lot of piece of our outreach. It's kind of just happened naturally that certain groups have discovered us coincidentally. So, yes, it is quite uh, eventful. Like, there are definitely groups reaching out to us. I can confirm that. That is good. Um, I was going to uh, raise a, an obvious point that um, there is a uh, enormous uh, amount uh, of uh, Australian nationalist ideological material. Um, I can testify personally if I was to take the oath that uh, when I was a person at, uh, say, the age bracket 20 or 21, that did not really exist. But now, of course, it actually does. Um, how uh, do you think you would go about embracing that material and integrating it into your work? You're obviously aware of it. Um, how, how are you looking to do that? Well, I'd say trying to take the the essence, the key points out of it and modernising it as such. For example, a way you could really get it to affect, uh, especially circles like on TikTok, is by having some pretty concise clips, maybe having quotes and stuff from it and just basically, you know, get the essence into a clip that thousands and thousands of people see, because applications like that, and also Telegram, but it doesn't seem to have as much of an impact in terms of outreach as that one does. I think it could be extremely effective in getting those across, if not just having, like, you know, through websites and stuff, you could have uh, references, you could have pages dedicated to, like, the most important how, however, that is subjective, but like having the most important literature up there to educate Australians. Yeah, obviously, yeah. Uh, you take the education aspect as a very, very important one. Well, if it wasn't an important one, I wouldn't be here. Well, take it. Um, obviously, uh, I think, uh, and I found it myself just, you know, knocking around and speaking to people, that there's often a, a great disconnect uh, many uh, many people are not aware of their country's history. Uh, they're not aware of um, their country's politics. And uh, do you feel that um, that's a problem for you? And how would you address that, the fact that a lot of Australians, and not just young Australians either, but a lot of Australians simply don't connect with their own country? Well, yeah, I do think that's to, do, uh, to a degree a problem, and I guess it's just a similar answer to the other question you asked, is just trying to, you know, get as much outreach as possible and just showing it to everyone, showing the most essential bits of history, showing what's been hidden and what's, you know, along those lines, that's all I can really say. Um, obviously, uh, in any uh, new uh, group of people, particularly one with a targeted audience, um, there's the role of uh, generalised outreach and uh, obviously you've indicated that um, you're attempting to do that outreach and uh, do you think that uh, that will develop in due course into specific uh, activist campaigns with a focus designed to create a particular result? Well, yeah, because, I mean, over the past few months we've I'd say between January to March period. I'll explain this in another podcast I was on. Uh, we went through a bit of an experimental phase, trying different things out, trying different, uh, you know, poster designs and stuff. And we, it's kind of like throwing throwing mud at a wall and seeing what stick, uh, what sticks. And so we've we've seen what sticks, 
and in terms of like kind of like specializing and having specific campaigns and stuff i do think that will definitely happen down the future however i don't think we're at that phase just yet um as you're probably uh, well aware um some uh, australian nationalists have uh, launched as best they can it's still early days even though the issue is very pressing uh, on the matter of the uh, so-called uh, Aboriginal voice to Parliament. Uh, I can tell you Australia First um, recommends a no vote. Um, we're developing reasons why. Is that likely to be a uh, campaign in which the ANF uh, blokes would be interested? And uh, if so, have they said anything about it so far? I'd say yes, that's something we'll probably focus on in the future. And it will be something that will, you know, gather interest because it's quite an essential bit of I guess a uh, campaign to contest or their campaign to push it if you know what I mean indeed uh, in other words uh, you you do look at the idea of uh, contest if uh, your opponent puts up a particular uh, argument you wish to argue against that argument um, I would assume uh, is there any debate uh, inside ANF um, your uh, various social media and whatnot uh, talking about this issue? Uh, not really, no. Uh, not, I mean, in circles in general, on like Telegram and stuff, there's definitely people talking about it. But, I mean, the, the voice, uh, that is. Mm -hmm. But in terms of just around in general, you know, not really. Right. Um, also, too, um, I don't know, uh, this, this question just comes from left field for uh, a few reasons. Um, has there been uh, any comment in uh, ANF uh, uh, regarding uh, the future of Australia, uh, whether or not um, the current government, as you know, is currently involved in a war? And uh, they're attempting to use Australian military equipment and uh, Australian resources uh, in war in, uh, in Ukraine. And uh, they're following the, uh, uh, the uh, NATO line and so on on war. Has this issue uh, impacted uh, in any way on uh, INF or its activities yet, or is it too early for that? It, it's way too early, that's right. all I can really say. Right. Probably, uh, as you're aware, um, uh, the organisations and all that of, um, uh, say, Euro nationalism uh, have come out uh, opposed to NATO, opposed to the European Union, and this false concept of Westernism. Uh, it does have an interesting impact here. Um, uh, do you find uh, any of your members who uh, might be uh, university students come up against this uh, conservative uh, pseudo-patriotic ideology that's being put out? I read some stuff last week by uh, our ex-Prime Minister Tony Abbott, you know, that the very definition of Australian patriotism is to get involved in someone else's wars. I take it you haven't come up against that yet? or uh... No, the, pretty much the overall consensus is to not get involved in that right is that uh, because you're building resources and uh attempting to you know broaden your contacts oh as in like not getting involved in wars in general as just oh. a national policy not as in getting involved in it uh, like as a topic organizationally if you know what i mean yeah i i, I follow your logic um at the moment uh in your uh in your workings have you identified any key issues that you wish to float out into uh, into the community, particularly the younger community, that you feel are uh, issues that have to be uh, broached, have to be discussed, uh, things that you're using as uh, recruiting tools? Well, the majority of our propaganda that's been going around has been mainly kind of like generalised uh, promotional stuff for the group in itself. The issues that have been raised uh, with some of our designs uh, is one like addressing Marxism, for example, and also the uh, drug epidemic throughout Australia, saying reject poison, that's one of our posters. Other than that, it's been mainly, as I said, uh, generalised, tailored towards building up ANF. Um, in uh, some discussions that I've had with uh, younger nationalist people, the uh, issue of immigration has really come and hit them in the face. Uh, do you find that uh, the young people you're uh, contacting, uh, how are they feeling about that? A lot of them feel like they're in the position where they are like a little island surrounded by an ocean of, you know, non-whites, non-Australians, 
a few of them have been bullied in the past and they've basically sought out a nationalist mindset for their own survival. Yeah, you talk about high school and similar intimidation or just in the community? Mainly high school. And uh, does that take the form of uh, uh, actual physical violence? Yes. There's been a few in, uh, few applicants, well, inquiries, I'll say, who have actually told me their stories and they've said that they have they feel, you know, kind of like a bit persecuted, like they're not in Australia anymore. And, uh, of course, if uh, certain lessons are being run the way they're reasonably run, um, if they speak out, they're the victims of intimidation. Yeah, you know, they're labelled stuff. And so usually what happens is they try to evade these people. However, they're also quiet at the same time, just for their own survival. Uh, any of the uh, people inquiring uh, girls, females? Uh, not yet. Not yet? It's, it's, you know, largely under 30s uh, males well, that, in general. Yeah, that can obviously uh, be a good thing in short term. Uh, yeah, that's I'll, true. I might uh, submit that um, in the long term, uh, if uh, a nationalist movement does not attract women, then uh, it does not leap over various hurdles. And uh, that's obviously something for the future. I, I would assume you, you've uh, considered that too. Yeah, down the track. I mean, it's a bit early because women aren't inclined to join these things as, as such compared to men. But then again, I will say on our TikTok, there have been a pretty substantial amount of women who have actually followed our channel. So there is a somewhat somewhat of an agreement in their you know, mindset towards it. Words, maybe the girls are just a bit quiet at this stage. And, yeah. Uh, seeing how, um, how things develop, perhaps. And you never know, you might get uh, quite a number of women uh, wish to affiliate. Certainly, it's always been the history of... Uh, uh, nationalist organisations uh, in Australia. There has been a predominance of males. I can tell you that. That's uh, certainly true. But there's always been a very, very strong um, female minority who have been involved at you know pretty much uh, every level of it, which I would regard as a positive thing. Um, obviously, uh, that's something for your future, and uh, uh, I'm sure you'll address it uh, when you yep. do. Um, if we just come back to the immigration uh, matter, what is it that um, the people contacting you are actually seeing? What is it that they think is actually happening uh, to their country? Well, the overall consensus is they think that their people are being replaced, that they're under attack, and they're being surrounded by foreigners who disregard their people, their culture, and pretty much their way of life. And uh, do they feel... Uh, and maybe competed against in places like universities, things like that? Yes. And uh, obviously, uh, have you had any resonance uh, with uh, tertiary institutions? Has uh, maybe students contacted you? Uh, a few, but it's it's like a mix. There's no real specific demographics in that, in that regard. Early days, in other words, uh, until something bites, you might say. Yeah. And uh, obviously, you've. Um, uh, let, let's just come back to that that other point um, that you're engaged in an outreach program, and uh, at some point, I think uh, I said to you that some of that actually becomes uh, political campaigning of one sort or another around issues to increase profile and uh, build support. Um, have you, uh, at the moment, uh, identified any issues that uh, might be worth uh, turning into campaign points? Or again, is that a little bit too early in your work? Well, I think what's considered right now is the upcoming, you know, voice to parliament. This is going to be coming up soon. Having a activist campaign on that regard would be quite productive, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you notice that uh, there is actually a lot of support for the Nova? Yeah, there is, from my personal experiences and um, conversations I've had. Yeah, in fact, um, some people are predicting that uh, yes won't get up. <laughs> Which, well, they uh, could, I think they could just rig it if they really yes. wanted to, but... Yeah. Rigging does happen, uh, as you're probably aware. 
there was a, a very famous lady, uh, she's now deceased, uh, pardon me, called Amy McGrath, actually wrote books about electoral rigging in Australia. So it's uh, not unknown, um, it's hard to say. But um, I think uh, the more people who vote no, I take it that uh, your uh, group will be publicly advocating no? Uh, yeah, that's correct. Right. Very good. Well, I look forward to us uh, exchanging uh, some uh, views and ideas on that. Um, yeah, well, I think that when it comes down to the Aboriginal voice to Parliament, the most important thing to consider is it's kind of like an excuse or a Trojan horse, you could call it, to have this, uh, what, what could you call it? This ethnic divide that's been perpetrated by the elite between Aboriginals and whites, trying to exacerbate that and use it against white Australians. And by them trying to change the constitution, it ultimately will have quite a lot of influence on Australians in general, because that means they'll have pretty much full control in a uh, legis uh, legislative manner once they pass it. And I mean, what they are mainly indicating at is once they have the voice passed, they're going to do a treaty. And then once they have the treaty done, it's just a slippery slope from then. You're on the same wavelength as me. Would you uh, take the, um, the view of some nationalists that um, many uh, Aborigines or Aboriginal backgrounded persons who may vote for this don't really understand what they might be getting? Yeah. That's, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, it has been uh, pointed out that uh, something like this could alter the actual sovereignty of the continent. In other words, uh, a group of persons might d decide to uh, sell certain minerals or enter into certain agreements or maybe even uh, contract for certain foreign labour under some circumstances to do particular things. In other words, rather than protect any and I use this phrase very, very loose, any idea of Aboriginal sovereignty actually destroy all sovereignty. So in other words, it is a Trojan horse against everybody. Yep, and that's why they're putting such a great effort in campaigning it is because of the overall slippery slope that it'll be. Have you uh, followed uh, the words of Jacinta Price? And I have a reason why I'm, I'm asking you this. It rings a bell, but I don't think so. Well, Lucinda Price, who's a senator from the Northern Territory, advocates a no vote, but uh, she's an Aboriginal backgrounded person. And uh, she uh, talks most of the time about the fact that uh, Aborigines are, part of, uh, are a part of diversity. And uh, that um, essentially uh, Australia should be, and I'll have to use this phrase, one nation to use Hanson's phrase, in which everybody is sort of the same. And uh, that seems to be a doctrine uh, if there, she's heading the no campaign. If she's adopted the idea of diversity, you'd have to wonder what the hell she was about. Yeah, that's a contradiction. It is, isn't it? It's, a, it's one of the enormous ones. Uh, I take it uh, your blokes uh, have also picked the fact that uh, any Aboriginal person is also confronted by immigration. Yeah. Yeah, I mean... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, these professionals like Mr. Uh, uh, Dobson and, and uh, Linda Burney and uh, Marcia Langton and all that, I haven't heard anything about immigration out of these fine spokespeople. What would be funny is if they get their way, the white man won't be their problem, but then the China man and then the Indian will be. Funny that, isn't it? And yeah. uh, I mean, we can joke at it, but we're in the same boat too, let's be quite frank, but you need a sense of humour, otherwise I don't think we'd, we wouldn't be Australians if we didn't. But I, I think you're very right to raise that. I, I hope that uh, that might creep into your, uh, your public outreach material. Yeah. I think that the prime time to consider a campaign against it would be when it's nearing the date, if you know what I mean, because that's when all eyes are on it. Right. Although, like, prior would also be good to, you know, lobby support against it. Yeah, indeed so. Um, coming right back um, very, very close to the uh, start of our conversation, uh, you mentioned that uh, many young people uh, are getting in touch with you and saying it's really great to um, 
uh, find a group of Australians on certain places and they want to communicate with you. Um, how hard has it been uh, for um, the people involved with you to actually uh, uh, locate the theories of Australian nationalism? It's coming on a bit from what we talked about before. Yep. Assimilating those ideas, putting it into a, a form. Uh, have you found this to be a really big task? Well, I think that one problem with Australian nationalism is that it needs to be more modernised. So usually what's the most focused on materials is the more, you know, the more national socialist stuff. That's what you mainly see circling around the most because it's the most modernised uh, in compared to Australian nationalism, in my opinion. And so that's one reason why I'm doing what I'm doing right now is because I'm attempting to have Australian nationalism, you know, catch up to speed and impact the youth instead of, you know, it being kind of like diverted away from a true authentic Australian message. Well, it's it's interesting that uh, you raise that again without naming any particular individual, but uh, I've actually seen um, some people um, actually plagiarise the works of um, nationalist writers, uh, <laughs> lift, uh, lift names from Australia's nationalist past and try to turn them into something else. Uh, attempted to uh, say they believed in ideas that they never believed in. Um, total misrepresentation. In fact, um, there's one person uh, uh, calling him a galar is um, probably not uh, doing him full injustice, but um, he actually lifted ideas from some of our material where we talked about laborism, which is one of the core aspects of Australian nationalism going back 120 years. It's one of those things that actually made it what it was and suggesting that it's something else uh do you think that uh your particular mission helps to uh make sure that the true ideas of australian nationalism flow only into that stream and are not misused yeah i do think so i think that you know because i'm i'm younger and i i'm you know have my head wrapped around technology more and we're doing uh, stuff on TikTok. And we're trying to stay as relevant and as, and as modern as possible. I think that it'll definitely have a pretty great impact in keeping the message uh, pure, so to speak. Well, uh, that's actually an interesting point. Like when we talk about uh, modernism and, and ideas, obviously our country, uh, the roots of nationalism go back to the 1880s, and that's a long time ago, coming up for almost 150 years. Um, <clears throat> obviously, some of the icons from that past, they don't mean exactly what they mean now or they don't have this, exactly the same uh, resonance, perhaps, sometimes that they mean now. Um, how would you work to, um, well, to take a controversial icon, um, uh, Ned Kelly, for argument's sake, uh, someone who's revered by Australians for a lot of reasons. Um, I'm not sure whether INF would want to market him, but let's just assume we were. How would you market him? What, what, what would it be that he would actually say now? Um, well... Let me think. I'd say that a, a um, anti-tyrannical stance, and I do think they would be able to market him quite successfully because he's a pretty well-known figure and everyone knows what he means. And, <laughs> and because everyone likes him, it's hard to turn that symbol or, you know, that icon into a, like a bad thing. It's hard to smear it, if you know what I mean. In a good sight. And uh, I think, um, obviously, a lot of the, uh, the symbols of Australian nationalism and our, our history, just about every aspect, usually by, uh, I'm sure you agree, uh, left forces, anarchist forces, all these forces uh, are attempting to misuse uh, even Australian icons, like even the Eureka flag I have behind me, and uh, suggest it means other things. And uh, so it obviously means every part of our heritage is under attack. I assume... You, t you guys take the holistic approach. It's every aspect of our heritage that's under attack. Yes. So our biology, our attitudes, our culture, our symbols, our icons, even, even the way, as I said to Nick Griffin recently, the British nationalist, even the way we Australians butcher the English language is unique to us. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so it's, it's obviously everything. It's a, it's a total struggle, if you like. The, the global system is waging a total struggle against Australians. Uh, would you agree with that concept? Yeah, I do agree. And therefore, you're saying that 
a total struggle has to be waged back. Yes. And, I'll, uh, yeah, I fully agree with that. I was, uh, suspected you might. Yeah, but uh, I, I, uh, I'd say that uh, obviously uh, as things develop uh, with uh, ANF on the ground, um, you obviously uh, meet a lot of different people who are uh, saying they're Australian nationalists and some who may in fact be members of uh, responsible and, and proper Aussie-oriented groups. How will you guys, uh, uh, what attitude will you take uh, to those people? I take it it'd be a friendly one. What would you do? Well, there's no reason to be unfriendly because the overall nationalist scene lacks the activist touch to it. So it's not like we're competing for any turf or anything. It'd be just cooperation as, as it is. And uh, obviously you'd be seeking that at every turn with every responsible group of people. As long as they're responsible. Indeed. In fact, that's something that uh, I'll also uh, raise with you just to the side, because uh, as you know, there's a big uh, campaign in the media and all that to suggest that nationalist minded people might actually be criminally minded or they might want to do uh, violence or, or something like that. I, I take it you're very aware of what the media says and uh, just tell me what your attitude is. Well, we disavow violence and we are fully aware of what they're trying to say about us, but it's usually our opposition, such as Antifa and you know radical communists, who are the perpetrators of violence. Indeed, and luckily you haven't yet been the victim of that. Mm. No, that's always positive. Uh, do do you um, obviously you make it very plain to everyone who contacts you that uh, if you get involved in this group, uh, we are a lawful group. Yes. Um, and uh, I have heard from uh, other uh, constructive uh, nationalists that uh, they wish to make that very clear uh, inside their organisations too, that we're not here to invite proscription on fake grounds. And uh, I take it you are aware that um, uh, you could be monitored by media outlets, even political police outlets, for what you say. Yeah, I'm fully aware of that. But we have to make a stand. And, uh, and uh, therefore, um, as long as you are lawful in what you do, you mentioned before you put up posters. Well, that's not exactly a horrendous crime, is it? <laughs> well, it's not. No, hardly. And uh, you, uh, when you do that, you obviously put up those posters pretty responsibly. I think I've seen some uh, pictures. In fact, I've even seen some. And uh, it doesn't appear to me to be in any way placed in the wrong place or done in a way that... Uh, would upset the community or anything along those lines. Well I'm, well, I'm quite pleased to hear that you've seen them indirectly. Indeed. A rather uh, price of fame. I've seen the uh, remains of a couple. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Which a, yeah, which is another matter entirely. Obviously, someone didn't uh, exactly approve of what he or she saw. Yep. Um, Obviously, you don't want to give the game away to anyone who is listening who uh, may have an ulterior uh, reason for listening. But uh, has the group uh, managed to uh, expand into many different areas? Uh, yes, we have. Um, obviously, uh, different states, different uh, cities, and so forth. Yes. Positive. However, um, I, will, I will say that my immediate priority is Sydney. But I'm, it's a national org, hence Australian National Front. Indeed. Um, I'd like to um, uh, just canvas a couple of other uh, very uh, general ideas. Um, in the uh, construction of, of uh, any uh, nationalist uh, uh, structure, however it's focused, whether it's a general one or a youth structure or um, some particular, uh, particular structure, um, it usually occurs that um, you do actually come up against uh, certain types of uh, opposition. And uh, as things actually grow and uh, more people perhaps uh, attend events, events and you know you might do uh, particular uh, street things, uh, have you uh, looked at a program to ensure at that level too that your activities stay uh, pretty tight, pretty lawful? Yeah. Uh, could you elaborate that on any way, or is that giving away anything at this stage? Uh, well, I'd prefer to just keep that uh, discreet for the time being. Correct. Um, so, uh, obviously, the plan is that uh, the group will uh, become more uh, more vocal, more visible, 
uh, and therefore uh, be something that uh, um, people can contact and uh, have a liaison with. Yeah, it will be. I mean, it's still early days, but we've had pretty successful outreach already, which pretty much indicates that the next six to 12 months, it'll probably be double, triple, if not quadruple the influence. Um, it seems to, um, and I, I know the great person Stevenson always used to say that um, you can import something occasionally from the outside, put it in the ground as fertiliser for a native plant. Um, without going into any particular details, why do you think it's been uh, that uh, some people, and I don't just mean funny people with strange ideological uh, predilections, but uh, why uh, some uh, people have looked to uh, foreign examples to inspire their nationalism? Why haven't they uh, necessarily always looked local? I think it's because they're disconnected with their people and their culture. That's why they're seeking other ones. They take inspiration off of foreign figures and foreign ideologies as opposed to the one that is right in front of their face. Well, obviously, as I said, it doesn't always mean that a foreign figure is a bad person or some particular idea is not a correct one. But um, do you think sometimes there's a bit of a tendency to like open up your mouth and swallow it whole without thinking, well, what is this idea? Where does it fit? Can it fit? Or should it even be rejected? Yeah, I think in terms of like, you know, the morality as such itself, there isn't always an argument like the people who are the foreign people and ideologies. There's no argument. However, the relevance is what's needing to be debated. Right. And uh, do you think that debate is actually being carried on in Australian national circles? I think that with the creation of ANF, it if it isn't already, it will be soon. I think, um, like, uh, obviously, a lot of um, matters have been in the broader uh, nationalist movement over a lot of time. Uh, many of these things, you know, different people have looked at something that might come from a particular country and does this have a relevance here? And but sometimes you get people who want to uh, join a group that's, I won't say where or whatever, but I'll pluck something out of the air. You know, it's registered in Switzerland and they think it sounds good and they want to be like that and model themselves like that and all of this, but they lose touch with uh, Australia, Australians and Australian reality. Um, I think it might be a historical problem, maybe in the history of our land. I'm not 100% sure. But it's good to see you bikes are uh, really uh, getting in touch with uh, who you are as Australians and where it all fits. And uh, I take it you uh, really hammer that on the inside too. Yeah, I mean, what I identify as is an Australian nationalist and it feels like the most authentic label I've given myself uh, to date. It makes the most sense to me and it feels the most legitimate. Indeed. Obviously, uh, if I can be grandiloquent, uh, one of our members uh, recently published a uh, six-volume collection of the works of John Curtin. And uh, I'll say to you that if you're in the tradition of John Curtin, then there's nothing that's un-Australian about you. And uh, that's how I see it from my yeah. point of view as well. Um, as we sort of wind up this discussion, there's probably a, a few things more that you might like to add. And uh, I know that I've conducted questioning here to, you know, put things, uh, put things down. But is there anything else that you think that uh, I've missed in uh, what I've asked you tonight? Well, I think I'd like to clarify the org in itself. Mm -hmm. For example, the name, the logo, the 1901 we've used and things as such. So we've called our group the Australian National Front, not because we're associated with any similar sounding groups, but because of the literal meaning of the name. We're Australian, we're a national org, and we're a front or a spearhead or a you know activism group pushing against the destruction of our people and culture. In terms of our logo, we have a circle with a shield and a southern cross in it. And then it says Australian National Front on the top, then folk land duty. And then on the sides, there are lightning bolts. So we chose the shield because it represents defending Australia and the southern cross, which is the you know symbol from the Australian flag. And then the lightning bolts represents, you know, being striking and effective and powerful. It's nothing to do with any you know, ideological symbolism. It's literally just lightning bolts. So that's a misunderstanding some people have had. And um, the 1901, we chose that as our 
uh, year because one, it's easier, for example, with the website anf1901.org, it's very easy to uh, remem uh, remember, as well as it's extremely relevant because that was the year that Australia, you know, federated and also the implementation of the White Australia policy. And so that's pretty much the explanation of those smallish details in regards mm -hmm. to ANF. And um, yeah, I don't think there's anything else we can add for that one. Right. And uh, is there anything else you want to say about uh, about the group? Uh, nothing off the top of my head right now. I think we're quite self-explanatory. We're an activist org. We're, you know, doing outreach programs and we're just trying to build and save Australia. Well, in, in an appropriate way, I'm sure that uh, all uh, Australian nationalists in uh, productive and useful groups will uh, assist you as best we can. I was also going to ask you, um, would you like to clarify what Australia First Party is for the viewers who are unaware of what it is? Uh, yes, okay. Look, uh, Australia First Party uh, is a uh, political party organised as an association and also as a registered party uh, in New South Wales. But our definition of party is not simply an organisation that contests elections. Political parties are broad-based things that engage in ideological work, ideological struggle. Uh, they're groups that are involved in the community directly and they may or they may not from time to time uh, contest elections. First point and then second point, Australia First is in the history uh, and politics of Australian nationalism back into the pre-federation period. And uh, we maintain that uh, Australian nationalism has three essential components. The literary radical nationalists who defined our identity in the 1880s, 90s, turn of the century. The laborists who set up the vision of a working man's land, of equal pay and equal justice and so on. And of course, nativism that defines our European background native to the soil. So Australia First is a bit of a, uh, a composite of things. And uh, we attempt to work constructively with um, people who may share some particular part of that or most of that or do a particular thing inside the broad church of that. So we're uh, very ecumenical, but we only work with reasonable and uh, pro-Australian people. I hope that answers pretty much what uh, your friends would like to know. I think that's pretty comprehensive. Thank you. Well, look, I'll, uh, I'll wind matters up at this point. Uh, I hope we've um, uh, talked uh, appropriately, that people understand what, what you're about. And uh, I reiterate that uh, where and when uh, we can help uh, your work, we're very, very pleased to do so. And I hope that uh, ANF will take anything that uh, we may be in a position to give in the proper spirit in which it's intended. So thank, thank you. you. Uh, before we wrap up, I just want to quickly say to the viewer, you can find us and all our content on anf1901.org. It's very easy to search up. And if you wish to join, we look forward to seeing your application.